Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm David M. I'm from the Global Research and Analysis team at Kaspersky Lab. Um, I'm going to talk less about targeted attacks, actually, than um, the sort of impact on that or, or how it relates to what we as individuals do. Um, and so I've chosen as a title, you know, your personal survival guide or how not to get hacked. Because whichever bit of the threat pyramid you look at, from the top to the bottom, so that's everything from equation or regin or some of these nation state sponsored attacks right down to cryptocurrency mining or banking trojans um, or ransomware. The starting point is typically hacking the human. How do you get somebody to do something that jeopardizes their security or corporate security? Um, and I'm really going to focus on this bit, um, where particularly the attackers are looking to get into a specific organization or indeed into a vertical within the marketplace or multiple verticals. So often, approaches start with an email. Um, and you sort of look at it, it comes from somebody maybe you don't know. Um, it's got some text which can be good in terms of grammar or bad in terms of grammar and an attachment, and somebody is hoping to get you to click on the attachment because that will install the malicious software on the computer. So, quiz time, and I'm not going to ask questions. You think about this yourself. What do you do about it? Do you want to open the zip file because it might be interesting? Are you going to save it to disk and scan it? Are you just going to delete the email? What do we do? Well, what would you do? Right, similar but not quite the same, because in this instance there's actually a link um, rather than an attachment. But the same sort of approach, they want to get you to do something, and that something is going to jeopardize security. Um, and again, back to the grammar point, the grammar isn't always good in these things. Um, so if you want to date with somebody who doesn't know how to use prepositions or rather definite articles, then go for it. Um, so again, you know, you might get a date. Do you reply asking for more information and thereby telling somebody that this is a valid email address? Or again, just delete it. And I'm guessing if I took a show of hands, everyone would delete it. Which is kind of funny because then it begs the question, why does this stuff work? But more of that in a bit. Um, so if we go back to the first message, there are some giveaway signs that this is not legit. So, you know, I don't know that email address. I don't know who this has come from. The, 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 the grammar is really poor, uh, and I don't know Pamela Adams or tax authorities, a bit vague. So the chances are we would all delete that. I hope so, anyway. Um, but what about something like this? It's a lot less um, vague, a lot more specific. It's a lot more legitimate looking. Not so many signs there that this is not a legitimate piece of email, and if you work in a, a small business, or indeed you're a sole trader, and it's that time of the year, you may well be tempted to click on that to find out what's going on. So question, well, do these things actually work? Do they really work? And the answer is a resounding yes, they do. Uh, if we look at some examples, and I'm digging back a little bit for some of these, but nevertheless they're striking, and that's why I'm using them. Back in 2011, RSA got hacked. Now, RSA is synonymous with security. Um, these guys are, I mean, you know, you think about the RSA uh, encryption algorithm, and these guys are behind it. So we're not here talking about some general organization where security impacts them, but they're not experts in it. They are. So in 2011, RSA announced that it had got hacked. So to their credit, they went public on this. They produced a blog. You can read about that still, and it's a really interesting read. Um, what happened? Well, they actually got an email, and the email was dealt with by the technology. The technology, their spam filter, dumped it into the spam folder. But a couple of their employees decided that it looked interesting enough to pull out and click on it. Um, and, and the email basically was very, very simple. It, it was just like, check out the attached file. And, and the attachment was 2011recruitmentplan.xls. So it wasn't anything really um, 
complicated in terms of the social engineering approach. It was just attachment and check out the file. But they checked it out and got infected. And, and so it went on. Um, they got infected by something called poison ivy. So this thing used a zero-day exploit, one for which there was no patch available. Um, having got initially infected, this thing then looked to move laterally throughout the organization, looked to gather data, and then exfiltrate that data. So standard targeted attack stuff. But all came down to what an individual had done, which put the company at risk. Now, the guys who got in, it was reported, took the algorithm behind RSA one-time passcodes. So pretty important. Um, HB Gary, I, I've put dumb users because occasionally, you know, that's the tenor of the conversation about this. If only people didn't do daft things, then, you know, we'd be secure. But actually it doesn't, it's not just users, it's not just staff, employees, this could be people quite high up in the organization. Now HB Gary Federal was a spin-off from HB Gary, specifically tasked with working with federal government in the US and other security agencies. Um, their chief exec announced that they had the goods on Anonymous, the hacking group Anonymous, and they were going to go public on names and, and locations. Um, these guys then launched a preemptive strike on HB Gary. Uh, again, they found a zero-day exploit. They got into their web server. They captured a bunch of credentials which weren't encrypted. Um, they used those credentials to get into other parts of the organization because actually two of the C-level execs in that organization had used the same password for uh, their LinkedIn account, I think, uh, for Twitter, um, also for the internal support server, as well as the website. And it was, I think, eight characters, six, um, uh, six, six letters and a couple of digits, and that was all. So the, the net result of this was that they published about 70,000 corporate emails, went public on it, embarrassed the company, obviously, severely. Um, it's since got acquired, but I mean, it's, it's, its rating level obviously dropped massively, so it had a huge impact on, on the company's reputation. Um, and this is people who, who ought to have known better because they were senior in the organization. You've got some of the classics there you know, of, of reusing passwords, non-complex passwords, um, and, and, you know, the fact that stuff wasn't protected. Um, sometimes attacks occur in a sort of stepping stone manner. So a few months after RSA got hacked, there was an attempted breach at Lockheed Martin. It wasn't successful. But interestingly enough, Lockheed Martin make use of RSA tokens, and it raises the question, can't answer it definitively, but it raises the question, was this an attempt to get to Lockheed Martin in the first place? Is that what the attack on RSA was about? We don't know. But you can see why plenty of people might want to get access to Lockheed Martin systems. Um, another example, probably less of a planned stepping stone, but nevertheless gives an indication of how that can sometimes happen fortuitously. So Dropbox announced uh, 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 an issue and it, it followed sort of rumors about, uh, you know, a breach and lots of people getting spam from Dropbox. Um, and what happened, in fact, was somebody who worked for Dropbox had an account on a completely unrelated website. And that website got hacked. And the attackers had all of these usernames and passwords, and they went through them and found a Dropbox email address with the password and thought, wonder if they use the same one inside their organization. And it turned out they did. So they were able to, to get hacked there. So again, a classic, reusing passwords across multiple sites, not a good idea. A classic example there of how that can jeopardize corporate security. It could be you, it could be me. This came through from, um, uh, uh, well, whoever, <laughs> actually. But the, the point is, that's a legitimate number. So, you, you know, they're trying to lend credibility to this. It's really difficult. When you look on the click here, 
you can't always tell whether they're legitimate or not legitimate by hovering over it and trying to decide whether that's a legitimate email or not a legitimate email. Um, and, and really, that's the sort of classic bare bones of your targeted attack. The start is spear phishing. In other words, a phishing approach which is geared towards the organization. And they will do their reconnaissance. You know, they'll check what people are saying on the website, who's who on the website, what are they saying on Twitter, when do they take their holidays, what software do they use, what connections do they have in the industry. All of that information is kind of grist to the mill for targeted attackers. It'll be an email typically from somebody internally, seemingly anyway, uh, spoofed to look like it's come from IT, spoofed to look like it's come from the chief financial officer, and so on. Um, with an attachment, and the favorites are Word, Excel, and um, Acrobat Reader. Using a zero-day exploit often, so one for which there is no patch because the vendor doesn't know about it. And it's quite possible that your antivirus defenses won't pick it up because if it's a bespoke attack, then where are they going to have got the code? So unless they're employing some proactive technologies that are going to be looking at the behavior and so on, then the chances are it's not going to pick it up at a signature scanning level. So you could be in trouble. So what do you do about staying safe? Well, the obvious thing is about not clicking on attachments and not clicking on links. When they have come from people you don't know, you can check. There are ways to check whether it actually has come from somebody. More of that later. Um, and if we go back to that thing I showed earlier, which came from tax authority, I sent that off to our virus lab. Response back, yeah, that's another variant of a particular malware family. And the bit I've circled or put a, a box around there, it's a downloader. Its purpose is to download malicious code. Um, it's a Win32 sample. It's called Eupatra. That's the malware family name. And then .cmcn tells us which variant it is. And for those who don't know, we tend to start at A and B, C, D, E, A, 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 B, A, C, B, A, B, 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 C. So if you're getting to four characters, and that's typical actually, then you're talking about something like um, 500 different variants. Um, sorry, 500,000 different variants. Um, sometimes we're hitting five characters, um, which takes us up to about 12 million or so. So these will be churned out on a factory basis in order to, to maintain some kind of persistence because the chances are that the week after that it's being detected and they need a new variant. So they all come with update capability so that they can maintain control on a compromised computer. So anyway, that turned out to be um, fraudulent, turned out to be malicious. Technical tips. Well, 64-bit systems are more secure inherently. Um, patching systems, because quite often, apart from the human aspect of this, the attackers will also rely on the fact that systems have vulnerabilities. It's not always a zero-day vulnerability. I mean, we know that if you think back to, to last year in the WannaCry outbreak, there was a patch available for that particular attack, but many, many companies hadn't applied it. Therefore, they were still vulnerable. Um, proactive technologies as opposed to just antivirus. Um, and we're talking about behavioral analysis, heuristics, sandboxing, um, looking for anomalies on the network and so on. There's lot, lots of different proactive capabilities there. Um, unique complex passwords and more of that in a moment. And then think about travel security. You know, if you've got staff going backwards and forwards to different places, particularly abroad, you might want to think about you know, what happens if stuff falls into the wrong hands. That could be because it's being screened at the border. It could be because somebody loses a laptop. It could be because somebody checks into a hotel and that is a compromised network and somebody is intercepting data. Whatever it is, think about what data you have and what might happen to it. So you know, take a separate computer maybe, or at least take the data off for the duration of the, the trip. Um, update before leaving. So, A, you're more secure before you leave, but also you're not then likely to click on something that purports to be an update, but is actually malicious code. And yeah, that sort of thing happens. 
Um, reinstall the operating system on return. Just re-image. Um, avoid hotel Wi-Fi if, if possible. If you can't, then think about using a VPN. On smartphones and tablets, I mean, there's, there's some obvious stuff. I mean, don't root the device. You know, have a, have a pin or make use of the, the biometric or use a long pass phrase or combine the two. Um, only install apps from trusted sources or set up a sort of whitelist approach, a whitelisting approach whereby only acceptable apps can be installed. Um, again, don't use public Wi-Fi or if you have to, don't do it for confidential transactions or use a VPN. And think about the data that's stored on the device. Don't keep it longer than you need it for because it's so easy for a device to be lost or stolen compared to, let's say, a laptop computer. So passwords, I said I'd come back to this. I mean, these guys every year look at, you know, what are the commonly used passwords and it, it's sort of <laughs> face palm time when, when you look at it as a professional. But actually year on year on year, this happens. Um, so, you know, one of the reasons for this, it's easy to tut tut, but one of the reasons for this is people have so many passwords and they can't keep a handle on them all and they can't remember them all. Uh, and so they just use something easy or they recycle them. But it really is a huge vulnerability. So, you know, I can do what security professionals do here and trot out the thing about, well, you know, use complex, unique passwords. Because, you know, we, we've all seen um, almost on a weekly basis, certainly on a monthly basis, there'll be a significant breach, lots of data, people's data ends up in play and you know, the advice comes out, well, actually, if you're using the same data elsewhere, you're in real trouble. But people continue to do it. Um, make it complex enough that it can't be easily guessed. Make it long enough that it's hard to guess. Um, and there are ways of kind of, of doing this um, without making it obvious, but, but still making it memorable. You can think about nursery rhymes or songs and, and you know, pick the letters of, of the, the, the words at the beginning of the song and, and jumble them up a little bit and add in other stuff. Or you can simply say, well, you know what, this is too hard to do. So I'm going to start thinking about maybe a password manager, something which will take the hard work for, off me and, and give me security. So. It's worth pointing out here, of course, that it doesn't have to be one size fits all. You know, if you think about your online accounts in a hierarchical way, there are some, like your, your email, for example, your email password, which are really, really important because that's often your username. Um, and if you're reusing that password, then you could be in big, big trouble. Now there, you might want to think about it and you might want to come up with something yourself, which is really complicated and not write it down and not use the password manager. But for a lot of the low level type of passwords where there's no money associated with that account, there's not going to be a massive lot of fallout if that account were hacked compared to something like, for example, your bank account or your email address or something with one-click shopping associated with it. Well, maybe for that stuff you use the password manager. So you can mix and match. Um, social networks, um, they're a key part of our life now. I mean, they're not something on the periphery. They're not a nice to have. They're a core part of how we live our lives today, both at work and at home. And yet, Often that is a way in which not only malware gets spread, but credentials get stolen as well. Um, so things to think about, well, how safe is the site? You know, are we talking about a secure communication? Is it HTTPS? And it sounds obvious, but actually, if you go to bank or, sh well, banking is different, but shopping online, you still find sites where they're not using HTTPS. Or indeed, you can go to sites where they've got legitimate stolen certificates. So ideally, have something installed on your computer, an internet security program, which can check the validity for you. But at any rate, there's, there's some things you can look at and check the certificate, at least um, yourself, you know, a cursory check of it. Um, how safe are you? And I'm thinking here in terms of, you know, what about your password? Is it a secure password, for example? Um, how safe is your location? So it may be that you're working from home. Well, use the VPN if you've been supplied with a VPN. Um, but it could be that you're out and about. One of my colleagues took this picture in a, um, an airport in Europe. Somebody had logged in to their Facebook account, done whatever they wanted to do, and moved away. 
and leaving anybody else just to come in and take over that account. So again, location is intrinsically insecure, but it's certainly your account is insecure if you're just going to play fast and loose like that with it. Um, one of my colleagues checked into a hotel in um, Latin America and they had kindly provided every guest with a tablet, which sounds great, very convenient, but there was nothing, no action taken to clear the information on that before they reissued it to the new guest. So my colleague, being a security researcher, decided he would dig a little bit uh, and found interesting stuff here. So uh, Facebook, um, a due date calculator, um, Gmail credentials, uh, contact, oh, sorry, um, bookmarks, probably not the due date calculator person, I would guess. Um, <laughs> And, and so on, contact information, all of this on, on that one computer. By the way, he, he discovered that two of the people whose credentials were in among this lot were government officials in that country. Um, so, the question, if this drops into my inbox, what do I do about it? So let's say this has come from my boss. Um, Project Sauron was the name of a very complex targeted attack. So. If Project Sauron 2.0 turned up, or turns up at any time, I will certainly be interested in that, because that's one of the core things our team does. Um, I have had emails like this, legitimate ones, not from my boss, I hasten to add, but I have, with a link in, uh, calling a meeting, and yeah, I would certainly be interested in that. So the question then is, well, what do I do about it? Do I open the PDF? Because it looks really, really important. Do I save it to disk and scan it? Do I um, delete it? And I've added a new one in there. Telephone him. Ring up Costin and say, Costin, did you send me an email about Project Sauron 2.0? And Costin can say, there is no Project Sauron 2.0. Or he can say, yes, I did. You need to be on that meeting. I've added another one. Report it to IT. Because if you are on the end of a, a, a targeted attack, your IT team needs to know. So again, what would you do? Um, now, there are always situations where you get this. Oops, I've already clicked on something. And what do people do about that? Well, there's some do's and don'ts. The first thing is not to panic. The second is don't switch the computer off because the IT team will need to do some forensics or get an external agency to do some forensics. You want to know, you want to freeze it in time as far as you can. And don't delete stuff for the same reason. Do report it to IT. Do disconnect it, because if it's something which is capable of replicating a worm or a virus, then you don't want it to spread to other computers. So it's often said that humans are the weakest link in security. Actually, intrinsically, they're neither weak nor insecure. They're, they're whatever you, you engineer. And we all need to get better at social engineering. The crooks are great at it, but we all need to get better at social engineering um, and, and turn that potentially weak link into a strong weak link. And it really means developing a security culture. Um, and it's not training. I mean, you could train somebody in a word processor. I would argue you can't train them in security. Um, you know, when we teach our children to cross the road. We're not teaching them to cross that road at that time of the day. We want to actually have them deal with any road traffic situation. So they need to think safety. And it's the same inside organizations. Um, it needs to be supported from the top down, because if it isn't, then you've got no chance. Um, I, I recall one conference I was at. There was a, a lady responsible for health and safety. It wasn't IT at all. In a large organization in the UK, and she was talking about how she got the message out there. Um, and she got buy-in from the board and needed it because what, what she was doing was turning up to people, let's say in the canteen, and saying, tell me what the five health and safety tips are. And people would, I'm not sure. And it's like, well, why don't you know? And it's like, well, we haven't covered it. So you go to your manager and you say, why doesn't that person know the five tips? At which point then maybe they're going to complain a little bit and say, why am I being put under pressure like this? But if Senior management has bought into this. It's like, you ought to know it. Make sure your staff know it. Um, 
it isn't an IT issue really. It affects IT, but actually it's, it's a culture issue. So it needs HR involvement, it maybe need, needs legal involvement. If you're looking to do this with sales and marketing people, it needs buy-in from their management too. Um, it has to be the right language. Too often, techies who understand all of this stuff get put at the front to talk to everybody about the issue. And, you know, there's, there's abbreviations left, right and centre, and there's assumed knowledge left, right and centre. And actually, if we communicate with the outside world, we have specialists to do that. Why not with internal security culture? It's really important. It's got to be personal. So if you teach somebody how to secure their router at home, then there's much more opportunity there for getting them on board with Wi-Fi security and why that's an important thing. Um, establish an open dialogue. You don't want a list of draconian measures which will make people clam up and not tell you when there's a breach. I can remember my first job in this industry actually, if you made any kind of mistake and you went to uh, the MD, because everybody reported into the MD, it was a startup, and you said, made a mistake, the response was always, well, what have you done? Let's see what we can do to fix it. And that's great, because it makes you tell somebody, as opposed to saying, oh, I hope I can cover that up and it's not noticed, in which case we're all potentially in trouble. Um, but you do need policies and procedures, um, and I'll, I'll come back to why in a moment, but rinse and repeat's important, simply because security is a bit like housework. You know, am I ever going to win against the dust and the grime? No, but I never, I never pose the question in that way with housework. I know I've got to do it every weekend. But I still do it, even though I'm being defeated, if you like. So it, you've got to constantly renew this process. Um, and I, again, going back to my first job in this industry, where telephone was much more important than email at the time. Um, <laughs> but the culture in the company was you pick a phone up in three rings. It's just what you did. And everybody... Was, was kind of inducted into that way of thinking. So much so, and I was head of tech support at the time, I would go to um, events that we put on and the CEO would say, you know, we, our staff pick up the phone, tech support picks up the phone in three rings, isn't that right, David? Let's try it. And I'd be sitting there sweating, thinking, please somebody pick the phone up. But they did, and that didn't happen out of the blue, it happened because there was that culture. And the same thing, by the way, in the sales department in the company was, you know, salespeople coming in referring to customers or prospects as punters. It's like, uh-uh, they're not punters. And in the end, it just got to the point where, you know, somebody came in and said, oh, yeah, I've got, you know, these, these punters lined up. It's like, tell him, Steph, they're not punters. And uh, so we socially engineered how people thought about security and other issues. Now, I said you need policies and procedures because there is always going to be a situation where somebody does what they shouldn't do, in spite of education, in spite of anything that you do. This, by the way, is a picture taken from a, an incident that happened at LA um, airport uh, a few years ago, about three or four years ago, I think, uh, where there was an engine problem and the aircraft had started to taxi out and had to stop. Um, now, we've, many of us, I guess, have, have made flights, and you're all, if you're a regular flyer, you're familiar with the patter, you kind of switch off from it. But in the event of emergency, leave by the nearest exit, taking nothing with you. Well, here's an incident, a major incident, and look at all those people who've just come off that plane down the chute. Uh, the guy in the foreground's, I mean, ready for another five week trip somewhere. So that's not taking nothing with him. So you need those procedures because actually you don't want somebody to say, well, I didn't know what the policy was. So if you do need to take some action against somebody, you can at least say, well, actually, here, here it is in the document. You're not reliant on that for your security culture, but nevertheless, you do need it in case you have a sort of insider issue, either witting or unwitting. Okay, with that, thank you very much for your attention. I hope it's been useful.